children's portraiture in the last quarter of the 18th century. Uh, as some of you hopefully know, uh, all this return to nature talk was largely inspired by the writings uh, of a philosopher, French language philosopher uh, from Geneva, um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, who in his books uh, propagated the ideas of the noble savage, return to nature. He believed uh, in the inborn equality and freedom of people which is only later um, destroyed by the social interaction. And one of the subjects that Rousseau was mostly interested in was child rearing. He wrote in 1762 a very famous book called Emile or on Education, in which he postulated kind of child-centered um, education and following the natural instincts, the natural curiosity of children, rather than forcing them through discipline to learn uh, from books. So many readers, especially from the aristocratic circles, those who had a lot of servants to do actual childcare, uh, started to follow the advice of Rousseau and um, this is also visible in art because they start to uh, to appear in portraits with their children or even commission portraits only presenting their children rather than um, entire families or or um, the adult only. You have to remember that this, this is the 18th century. Child mortality in all social classes was still very high. So it wasn't taken for granted that the child that was born would live to be an adult. And uh, here we have a, a quite a poignant story illustrating that, the story of Sir Brooke Bootby. He was a, a local gentleman, um, something of a poet, something of an intellectual, a friend of artists. Uh, some of his friends included um, Joseph Wright of Derby, whom you will meet again uh, later uh, today, and Reynolds and uh, John Henry Pusley, whom you will meet later on when we talk about Romanticism. Uh, so here we have a portrait of Sir Brooke Boothby uh, as an intellectual man reposing in nature. Uh, this is reminiscent of one of, the of one of the Tudor paintings, if you remember. So he was a very cultured, educated man, but uh, he had a daughter, he had an only child, a daughter, whom he adored, her name was Penelope, and unfortunately, when she was five or six, she caught an illness and died, leaving her parents, and especially her father, completely devastated. So, um, this is a similar situation that you may remember from Kochanowski and Ursulka, but uh, um, in the 18th century in England. So what uh, Brooke Boothby started to do was to commission artists to commemorate Penelope. And here we have uh, her beautiful marble sculpted tomb in the local uh, church where she was buried. And two major artists, Fusli and Reynolds, um, presenting uh, portraits of Penelope, especially the apotheosis of Penelope Boothby by John Henry Fusley, as um, little Penelope is taken uh, to heaven by an angel. And the portrait of Penelope by Reynolds, this is the inspiration for the Millet child painting uh, that uh, was the first in this, in this presentation. So, as you can see, in the previous generations, Crying so much and despairing so much over a death of a small child uh, would be seen as maybe not crazy, but immature and generally um, wrong. Uh, in the 18th century, the late 18th century, this is becoming normal. This is a sign of humanity, of um, good... Um, I would say emotional disposition of the people and you have a lot of portraits featuring parents and especially mothers. Rousseau appealed especially to mothers that they should take more interest in their children, not only their pets. 
uh, that they should breastfeed their children themselves rather than uh, employ servants, wet nurses to do the breastfeeding. So we have some portraits, mostly by Joshua Reynolds, of aristocratic ladies, including the famous Duchess of Devonshire, playing and cuddling and even breastfeeding their children. This was a fashion for many of these aristocrats, but for some of them, like the Duchess of Devonshire, this was um, uh, something uh, genuinely um, important, something that uh, she believed uh, made her a true woman. Uh, there are also quite a lot of pictures featuring children, only children, uh, not as parts of family groups. And uh, here we have some works by Reynolds, a very famous painting called Master Hare, and this little child is actually a boy. Uh, it is indicated by the title. And you have to remember in the 18th century, toddlers, little children, before the age of four or five, uh, wore almost identical clothing. So loose gowns, loose dresses, something that wouldn't uh, interfere with their movements, with their playing. Uh, very often little boys wore their hair longer. So uh, sometimes you see a child in the 18th or 19th century portrait and you wonder whether it's a boy or a girl. Sometimes if it's a small <coughs> child, it's really difficult to say. So uh, here we have another portrait by Reynolds uh, showing a little girl with her pet dog. So we have uh, quite frequently images of children with animals, especially dogs, but other animals as well. Uh, and the implication was to show the parents, especially the mothers, that children were not some tedious duty that they were forced to uh, care about, but they were as interesting as the lap dogs or cats or trained birds or such, uh, such pets. Gainsborough was not so much a specialist in child portraiture, but he produced uh, some very interesting works, including one which is perhaps the most famous child portrait in the 18th century. But first we have two, uh, two double portraits of the artist's own daughters. You can see he loved them very much uh, and uh, they had a very close bond uh, between uh, uh, themselves. Uh, one portrait shows them holding hands in the garden trying to catch a butterfly. So uh, there is also a little air of melancholy. Uh, even the two girls have been likened by critics um, to a butterfly, like two wings of a butterfly. Uh, which point to the fact that children are very delicate, that they can die easily. Actually, the first child of Gainsborough and his wife died in infancy. Uh, so he was uh, very afraid that his daughters would also die in childhood. They didn't. They didn't have happy lives, but they survived into adulthood. Uh, and uh, um, we have a lot of tenderness in the way that the girls are presented and in the ways that their mutual relationship is also presented. Uh, in the second painting, uh, again, it is an unfinished painting and you can see just barely the outline of a cat that the girls were holding. Perhaps the cat didn't want to pose. This is what cats do. Uh, but you can see that the two girls, slightly older now, um, embracing together and uh, looking really like a very loving pair of sisters. Uh, this very famous um, English child painting, however, is the very famous blue boy. So uh, a boy dressed in beautifully rendered blue costume. Uh, shown on the background of uh, stormy skies. Uh, this child was not an aristocrat, he was a son of an acquaintance of Gainsborough, uh, but the way that he is presented, the way that he is shown wearing the costume, this really became something of an icon of um, child portraiture. Uh, and. Um, the blue boy uh, is really something that was remembered by, this is part of cultural memory of, uh, of um, English art. 
Some say this was uh, Gainsborough's response to Reynolds, the brown boy, so one of his child portraits showing a young teenage boy uh, dressed in a brown costume. <clears throat> it inspired more paintings such as Thomas Lawrence's uh, portrait of a girl called Pinky because she wears a pink bonnet and pink sash. Uh, so uh, here we have uh, uh, those child portraits from the 18th century and uh, in the last uh, part I will tell you what to do next. So the last few pictures show a uh, more characteristic, more typical work of uh, Joseph Wright of Derby. As you can see, he was the master of light. He uh, loved to experiment with different sources of light in his paintings, especially with artificial light. So indoor scenes uh, and his most famous pictures show um, scientific experiments presented indoors by candlelight, by um, scientists uh, doing some experiments. One is a, a philosopher giving a lecture on the orrery. The orrery was an instrument um, imitating or, or illustrating the movements of the planets. And the philosopher here uh, does not mean a philosopher in the modern sense, but a natural philosopher, which is an 18th century word for a scientist. So we have a group of people, including some children, um, gathered around a machine or uh, an instrument that shows the movement of the universe. Uh, some are just fascinated, uh, some are making notes, uh, the children are quite entertained and here we have the scientist um, explaining the uh, functioning, the, the working of this instrument. On the other one, uh, the experiment on a bird in an air pump, the experiment itself is um, more cruel because the <clears throat> bird is enclosed in a, a glass container and the air pump pumps the air away from the container so the bird starts to uh, to choke, to be suffocated. And again we have a group of people gathered around the table with the philosopher, with the scientist demonstrating. <clears throat> and uh, here we have even more interesting reactions from the people. Some of them have the scientific curiosity, some of them like those little girls in the uh, in the <clears throat> touch of light are uh, shocked, are moved to tears by the danger that the bird is in. Uh, and the young lovers, slightly in the, uh, in the background on the left hand side, are not interested in science at all. They just take an opportunity to, um, to woo. So the end of the 18th century is also the beginning of um, the uh, industrial revolution, so the industrial revolution that has been happening uh, for a couple of uh, decades now uh, starts to be visible in culture, starts to be visible in the landscape. So you have some images uh, of um, bridges and canals uh, uh, and uh, other technological inventions uh, also catching the eye of artists. So we have a painting of the new Westminster Bridge in London being constructed. We have also new technologies such as uh, the um, Wedgwood Pottery Firm, a family firm which specialised in good quality um, uh, pottery, ceramics. And here we have some works very typical for the Wedgwood style of the turn of the 19th century, uh, inspired by classical antiquity, especially the so-called portent vase, which shows the scenes from classical Greece uh, represented in 18th century pottery. So we have um, new technology uh, used to um, recreate uh, classicist themes. 
thought from this presentation you will get the links to um, one more documentary. The title is The Secret History of British Art Collectors. This um, features some subjects that we have uh, already covered. So uh, from the Stuart period, when the royal family was very deeply engaged in collecting and buying works of art, through the 18th century and the 19th century, so please watch the documentary. I will also attach a short quiz. So after you have watched the documentary, uh, do the quiz. It's not to be graded, it's just um, to make sure you remember important things from the documentary. And please send me via email or any other way uh, the answers to the quiz. Okay? So thank you for this week.